Well, if you had the chance to join us on Friday night, we had a very fun game night, I think. We had a lot of people here, and yeah, it was awesome. We had a good time. So we'll have to do that again. So uh, if you didn't make this one, we'd love to have you at the next one. We don't have a date set, but boy, it was a lot of fun, and it just was just just good to be the body, hanging out, having fun, laughing, hearing kids running up and down the hallways, and um, it was just a great night. So thank you for all of you that that uh, came and just helped bring that night together. Why don't we have a word of prayer before we continue on in our sermon today. Father, um, you are a good, good father. You're a father that so far exceeds any earthly father that any of us could have ever experienced, God. Some people had great fathers uh, on this planet, but yet it still is nothing compared to the good, good father that you are. And we praise you for that, that no matter what our earthly experience is, God, you are good. And uh, we praise you. We thank you. And God, we pray that now as we open uh, your word, that you would teach us, that you would challenge us, God, that your spirit would would speak to our hearts. Um, as I often pray, God, I don't want to be in the way of what you're trying to communicate. I simply want to be a messenger. So I pray, Father, that you would come through loudly and clearly just through your word today um, and meet us where we are and challenge us to move forward, wherever that would be, God, in our journey with you. And so we just ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> last October uh, started a series on the book of 1 Peter, and we spent several uh, weeks looking at the first couple of chapters of 1 Peter. Uh, but then we took a, a break because Christmas rolled around and we wanted to do some things focused on Christmas. And then um, also we uh, wanted to spend a few weeks talking about elders, because as a church we're looking at making a shift from the leadership team that we have to more of an elder board approach, and so um, we wanted to process that a little bit, you know, biblically and theologically with the congregation. So uh, if you missed any of those or, and wanted to get uh, more on that, those messages are all on the website. You can go and listen to them um, just to help you understand clearly what we're talking about and where we're going. So, But today, we're going to come back to 1 Peter. We're, we want to come back to this, this book. We made it all the way through chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, that's, that's where we got to when we, when we took a break, the end of, or the beginning of December. And uh, um, we're going to pick up in verse 13 today, although um, it's important to look back once again at the those verses at the end of chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, and we're going to do that in a moment. But before we do, I, I just want to just say that it, we need to kind of take a step back and do a little bit of a review so we can kind of remember where we were in this letter and in, and in the context of this. Peter wrote this letter uh, to believers that were living in exile. They physically were living in exile uh, because of persecution. They had been scattered uh, about. They were in Asia Minor, is where a lot of the recipients of this letter were living in different places, which would now be uh, modern-day northern Turkey. And, and so um, he's writing to this community of believers that have been exiled. As a matter of fact, this idea of exile is a common theme that runs through this letter, that they were exiles not only physically, but Peter draws out this spiritual sense of being exiles. He draws out this sense that, that uh, because you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the world that we're living on right now really isn't our home. That we, as believers, all of us, whether it was those original readers or all the way down to you and I, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We are citizens of heaven. And so from that standpoint, all believers are exiles. And so he, 
he writes to these folks that are living physically and spiritually in exile to encourage them to be faithful, to live for God, to continue to grow, to continue to mature. The, kind of the hinge verse, I believe, in this whole letter is where we ended last week, First Peter, or last sermon, way back in at the end of November, uh, was First Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12. And I want to read that to kind of bring us back to where we were. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of your flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. As, as Peter builds up to, the, to, to this statement that he just makes here, um, he begins by reminding these believers, first of all, of their identity. If we go back to the beginning of chapter 1, building up to this 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12 verse. He's reminding them of their identity. He wants them to understand that even though they are in exile, physically and spiritually, even though they are living in the margins of society, even though this world is not their home, that they could live productive lives for God. They could live lives that bring influence for the kingdom. And so Peter begins with a very important description of who these people are. And it's applicable to you and I because it's true of all believers. And so the idea is when we understand who we are in Christ, then we can live that out. I, the more I, I study Scripture, the more I, I, I'm convinced this idea of identity leads to our living is so important. And, and, and so, and I see it, you see it over and over uh, in the writers where they're talking about who you are and how then, in light of who you are, should shape how you live. And so, Peter, um, in this like first one and a half chapters, reminds. Uh, the, the readers, who they are. They are exiles. They have been chosen by God. They've been sanctified. They've been given a new birth. They've been born again. And because of that, they have a living hope. They have a permanent inheritance in heaven. And, and, and with all of that identity in place, they've been called to get into action, to live out their identity, to prepare minds for action, to be sober-minded, to set our hope on Jesus Christ and on, the, uh, and on His return. We're called to reject evil desires and pursue holiness. Live life in a reverent fear of God and to love one another and to grow up in our faith. That we would mature. That we don't just become a Christian and then sit there and wait for Jesus to come back. But that we continually are growing and maturing. And as we move into chapter 2, Peter reminds them that as followers of Jesus, they are living in a new community. That they, that, that they are this thing called the church. Not buildings, uh, not institutions, but, but the church is people. And we, if you're a believer in faith, and he reminds his original writers, you have a new community. It's your brothers and sisters in the faith. You, the church, have been given new community. And it says in that second chapter that we are living stones. We're like living stones being built into a building. This building of the church. It's a community that's been ordained by God to move the gospel forward in the world, to advance the kingdom of God. In other words, this new community, the church, has been given a mission, even in exile. We tend to think, oh, if I'm in their shoes, 
I'm in exile. I guess I need to just sit and wait till this time period ends, however long it's going to take, because um, now I'm in exile, so it, life is hard. And Peter's saying, no, even in exile, even in exile, you have a mission that God has given you. The mission doesn't go away because you're not in your homeland. Now, maybe the mission is even more important because you've been moved out of your homeland further away to a place where probably more people know nothing about God. And, and, and so he's saying, we have a mission. John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus says to his disciples, and I think it's applicable to you and I, he says, as the Father sent me, uh, now I am sending you. He sent us on mission, and, and we do this mission together in this new community. We thrive in this new community. We grow in this new community. We pray together. We study the Word together. Uh, we share the Lord's Supper together. We have community and fun and relationship. And shoulder by shoulder in this new community, we accomplish the mission that God has called us to. And as this community, we have access to Jesus. He is the cornerstone. We're the little stones. He's the cornerstone. And that we build upon this thing called the church. We're the people of God. We're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen nation. We belong to God. And so, our identity is completely changed. It's completely wrapped up in Jesus Christ. We're part of a new community that lives for the purposes of bringing glory to God by living out our new identity on mission for God. Hence, this passage. I'm going to read it again. Because it's kind of the key transitional passage. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I love what Chuck Swindoll uh, says in regards to this passage. He says, you and I live as Christians away from home. Although we're temporary residents of a particular nation here on earth, we're actually eternal citizens of another land. Let me put this plainly. We live in the midst of a pagan culture surrounded by pagan people who embrace a pagan philosophy and a pagan way of life and a pagan attitude toward believers. But God has planted us here to be ambassadors of a different kingdom and to lead others to that better city whose architect and builder is God. This passage, this 1 Peter 2, 11, serves as a great transition to Peter's next thoughts. He's going to describe now, he's going to, now that he's laid this foundation, he's, it's all rooted in who we are in Christ and what God is calling us to. Um, he's going to describe now uh, how this new community can live their lives so that it puts God on display. Because that's, what, as this new community, we should be doing in the world around us is putting God on display by the way we live our lives. And we must have this understanding about who we are. It's foundational. Our life has been fundamentally changed. You're a new person that belongs to a new community. And your identity needs to permeate every aspect of your life. We need to live lives focused on what God has called us to be and to do. In America, one of the big issues with getting that done is distraction. There is so much distraction in the world we live in. There's so many things that get us off course that take our attention affluence 
a lack of persecution, consumerism, me first, and entitlement. Uh, uh, all those things keep us busy from being on mission and living out who we are. Somehow I think we've gotten really good at compartmentalizing our lives. It's like every part of our life is just a compartment. And, and, and when we get ready to do that thing, we kind of open up that compartment and do those things that we do, and then we kind of shut that compartment up and move on to the next thing. But that is so not how God has called us. God doesn't want to be a compartment. But often, that's what's happening in, in the Christianity of America. We don't have time for all of that stuff, to really live for God and live out my identity. Do you know how time-consuming that's going to be? I don't have time for that. And we make excuses. And somehow we determine that really living that way is for the leaders or the missionaries or the people that are just really radical about Jesus. And, and so the way I'm going to live out my faith, my compartment for faith, is I'm going to go to church and be once a month. I mean, I'm busy. I might even help. I might put a little money in the offering plate. I might even serve once in a while. And then we wonder, why is the church in America in decline? Why, why are things stagnated? It's often because we're not stepping into who we are. We're treating God like a compartment in our life and He doesn't want to be a compartment. We're called to serve Him. If you're a true believer in Jesus, I really believe you're either living in obedience or you're living in ignorance and really don't know some of the things that are in God's Word and so therefore you're not living a certain way because you didn't really know that you should. Or third, we live in disobedience. We just know the stuff, but we, we're too busy. It doesn't fit my compartment. And so Peter says, look, you have this incredible identity, and I want you to live it out so that the world will, will see Jesus. And in chapter 2, verse 13, Peter begins to show us how we can put God on display for the world to see. In the last message I shared with you uh, uh, back the last week of November, uh, I shared a quote from Tim Chester and Steve Timmis from their book, Everyday Church, and they said this concerning this last two verses we've just been talking about before we get into 13. They say, 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12 is just the, is just the headline. Peter then goes on to apply this mission strategy to our life in society, the workplace, and the home. What, what Peter is giving us is a mission strategy. He's showing his readers what it looks like to live in a state of exile among people who in many ways are hostile to Christianity. <clears throat> And we have a lot to learn from these early Christians. We have a lot to learn from the early church that the way the church functioned in the first 300 years of its existence. Christian historian and church um, history scholar Stuart Murray states this about pre-Christendom, which would be the, the, that first 300 years. W once in the 300s when Constantine legalized Christianity in Rome, Christianity took a turn and began this, this era that's been called Christendom. Before that was what we would call pre-Christendom. And he says this, we know of few missionaries in pre-Christendom. Pre Missions depended primarily on the witness of unknown Christians Countless acts of kindness, family, and friendship connections, and provocative discipleship, and significant conversations. Evangelism was a lifestyle, not a specialist activity. And so that's where we're going. That's what Peter is getting at here. 
living that kind of life. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. We've kind of caught everything up. We're on the same page here. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. He says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put silence, should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom to cover up evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. See, Peter is describing to us, beginning to describe to us, to, to give examples. There's going to be more examples that follow. We're just going to look at this one today. Uh, but he begins to tell us how we should posture ourselves in the culture. How, as citizens, we should behave. The way we respond to people, to people that don't know Christ, the way we respond to those in authority over us speaks volumes about the God we serve. As a matter of fact, again, we'll see that a huge part of the missional strategy that Peter is giving us is how to respond towards hostility and difficult situations with good deeds. Remember, let's go back to those, that hinge verse there that says that we should live such good deeds among those that don't know God that, that they would ultimately glory, glorify God on the day of visitation. These good deeds, what, are, what, what do these good deeds look like? Because the biggest impact that we can make is not necessarily attractional activities, but rather it's through attractional community. Living lives in such a way that cause people to ask questions. To wonder why we are the way we are. Why do you do that? That's not what I thought of you. So in other words, it, it isn't all about inviting people to an evangelistic event at the church. Rather, our lives are the evangelistic event. The way this new community lives their lives and the way they interact with one another will paint the clearest picture of Jesus to the world. Our lives together as a community and the way we interact with people around us become the apologetic. Now, this doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't also be in the proclamation business of the gospel, sharing it, speaking it with our words. That's absolutely essential. Some would say, oh yeah, just live like Jesus and everything will be okay. Well, we need to speak the gospel as well. But often, it will be our lives that lends credibility to our words. And so Peter turns to some tangible good deeds Let's look at the first one. It's simply this. As I've already stated, we submit to authority. Peter tells his readers that they should submit themselves to every human institution. The word in the original Greek for submit here means to be or become inclined or willing to submit to orders or wishes of others or showing such inclination. In a more simple way, it literally means to order under another. It was a Greek military term that was used describing voluntary submission to another. And notice he says, to every human institution. This broadens the scope of submission to more than just the government authorities, although specifically that's what he's focusing on here. But it opens it up to other Areas of authority in the home and on the job and at the school and in the church and, and, and different areas where there is authority. And again, specifically, 
here in these verses, he's addressing the emperor and his governors that are carrying out his will. And he says that this submission is to be done for the Lord's sake. See, he is glorified when his followers submit to authority. He gets the glory. Authority has been ordained by God because we submit to God, we need to submit to the authorities he has established. Now, we need to remember this letter was written to people, the original readers of the letter, were living in the Roman Empire. They had been persecuted. They were scattered. They had been mistreated. Many disowned by family members. Um, If you were a Jew and you became a follower of Jesus, your Jewish family usually shuns you or disowns you. And and certainly, um, they were subject to the the Roman rule that was fairly anti-Christian. And the Roman emperor at the time was Nero. And daily he was becoming more and more of a lunatic. And so when when these original, imagine being these original readers, living in this, I'm away from my home, I'm uncomfortable, um, I I am homesick, I'm living in exile, and I'm living under the thumb of the Roman empire, and the emperor is a nut job, basically, right? He goes crazy eventually. Brutal, some brutal persecution eventually. Probably wasn't quite kicked up yet, according to most scholars, but it was beginning, it was developing. And so partly why Peter is writing this is to say, get ready, more persecution's coming, life's going to get more difficult. And so when they read this, it wasn't just a little weird, it was radical. Are you kidding? Submit to Rome? To Nero? But this isn't the only place that we see this mindset. We see way back in the Gospels, Jesus says, give unto Caesars what is Caesars. Or give unto Caesar what is Caesars. In Romans 13, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us to submit to the governing authorities. In 1 Timothy, Paul calls us to pray for those who are in authority. We see this idea throughout the New Testament that as believers, we submit to the authorities. We live in submission. We follow the laws. Why is this so important? 1 Peter uh, uh, in 2.15 says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Ultimately, It's submission to God, and it's how to silence this ignorant talk of foolish people. At the time of the writing of this letter, there were a lot of baseless accusations that were floating around about these Christians. Um, There were those who said they, they were rebellious, that they actually served a different king, that they wanted to overthrow the government, that they were sub, uh, subversives. Some even accused these, these Christians of being cannibals because they ate flesh and drank blood. The Lord's Supper. We know that's not really literally what was happening, but they would get accused of that. And so, part of what, what Peter is saying is voluntary submission to the authorities will... Stop some of that foolish talk. You will be what they don't expect you to be. They think you're going to try to overthrow the government. Well, no, you're not there to overthrow the government. You're there to be peaceful and to love one another and to love the people around you. And and, and you're going to live under the submission of the government. Now, I want to be clear. While Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, Jesus also said in the same phrase, give to God what is God's. God is our supreme leader. We are to be faithful to him first. 
But if following the authorities doesn't violate God's commands, then we need to be submissive to authorities. They were placed there by God. This doesn't mean that every leader is going to be in God's will. It doesn't mean that there won't be things in our leaders that violate the values and the standards of God. Nero was no picnic. Can you imagine trying to honor Nero? Swindoll states that Peter's call to submit to established government as a system for maintaining order doesn't mean that God endorses every every particular ruler. Nor does he approve of particular laws that stand in defiance of his will. Believers are not obligated to follow laws that conflict with his clearly revealed will. The Bible does not instruct God's people to keep silent in the face of obvious social and political injustices. In cases where God has given his people a command, like preaching the gospel and shunning idolatry, believers must obey God rather than human leaders. But in doing so, they must also be ready to suffer the legal consequences for that disobedience and outspoken criticism. Examples. Old Testament. Do you remember Daniel gets taken into captivity and along with him uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, eventually their names are changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, as well as other uh, Jewish you know, people are brought into exile into Babylon. And uh, um, they, they go through this experience of, of you know, trying to be shaped into Babylonian culture. So how do they live? What do they do? In many ways, they went along with what was happening, but there were things that they took a stand on. Also, um, you look at, the, at, in Acts, the apostles, as they were preaching the gospel, they were beaten and thrown into jail and told to stop preaching the gospel, but they kept preaching it anyway. In today's world, we have brothers and sisters around the world that are not believe, or that are, are trusting Jesus, but they're not legally allowed to exercise their faith and, 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 and to do what we're doing today, but they do it anyway. See, we're not talking about these kinds of things. But if, if we do come to a place where the government says this and it violates what God says and we step out, we must be willing to suffer whatever consequences there are. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego still went to the fiery furnace. Now, God rescued them, but they didn't cave because of what was coming. Daniel went to the lion's den. Esther stood for her people uh, and, and approached the king. And as I said, the apostles preached anyway. But where it's not the case, of being disobedient to God, we're called to submit. How do we apply this today? We live in compliance to the laws of the land, even if we think some of those laws are senseless or foolish. Not laws that would violate God's law or God's heart, God's commands, but laws that we think are just kind of silly. We don't just dismiss them because we think they're silly. We live them out. We respect the president, whether we voted for him or not. And we pray for our leaders. We don't cheat on our taxes. We give respect to police, the teachers, city officials. We're model citizens. We should never be known by our lawlessness or disrespect of authority. Our proper behavior, being humble, being submissive, will lead to some curious conversations with people who are far from God. And it will allow us to speak of God's amazing grace and how He has transformed our lives. Verse 12 tells us that we looked at earlier that it, our good deeds ultimately point to God. Now, another thing that's important to understand for how we live this out Our culture, our government is different than what they were encountering under the, the Roman rule. 
In Peter's day, if you challenged the government, it meant punishment or death. In our country, um, we have a right to speak into our politics and to the government. We can vote. We have free speech. We can stand for things that we don't agree with. And so, we need to understand that in our context, it doesn't mean just laying down and letting whatever happened, happen. We need to share our voice. We need to exercise our vote. We need to speak into the culture. We should stand for things uh, that in our government and in our laws that would violate God's written word. But how we do this matters. We exercise the freedoms that we have as American citizens in a God-honoring way. If laws are, are, are passed that force us to disobey God, we can resist because ultimate authority comes from God. If there are laws that are passed that we just don't like, or if there's politicians we don't like that get elected, we're, we're still called to obey those laws and respect and pray for those and love those politicians. It's not wrong to have a voice. It's part of our American governmental structure. We should exercise our responsibility, but do so with humility, with love, with grace, with, with wisdom. I'm reminded, going back to Daniel, in chapter 1 of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar has all these, the best of the best young men, and he's really puts them in a training program to, to develop them into walking, talking Babylonian thinkers. Okay? He, wants, he knows they're coming out from a Jewish you know, religious system, and he wants to take the best of the best and use them as his court officials. And so he is putting the pressure on, changes their names. Um, he, he is teaching them the language, the culture, the history. He's really trying to inundate them. But one of the things that he does is he changes their diet, which is a big thing to a Jew. There were food laws that God required, and now suddenly they were eating food from the king's table. And Daniel's in a predicament. Okay, he can learn the culture, he can, he can learn the language, he can do, those are, those are not violating God. But if I eat the food that you're giving me, but Daniel doesn't just throw a fit. He doesn't just roll around the floor and throw a tantrum or lash out or say horrible, mean things about the leadership or about Babylon. He approaches one of the chief officials that was overseeing him and some other men, and he said, I don't want to eat this food. Can I make a proposition? Would you allow us to, to eat just vegetables and drink water for a while? and then just see how we are. And the official agreed. And lo and behold, after this little test, they were stronger and healthier. They, they proved that I don't have to eat this food from the king's table. See, he, he didn't handle that in a brash, arrogant, harsh way. He used wisdom. And I think that's an example for, for, for you and I as we interact with culture, do we do so in a loving, kind way? Are we humble? As I was studying and preparing for this message, the State of the Union address happened this week. And literally, while on Wednesday, while I was sitting at a table at a coffee shop, literally writing this sermon, I had my phone out watching vote by vote, the impeachment uh, deal. Guilty, not guilty. This has been a big week in our country. And we are so divided. And this week just put an explanation point on that. If you watched any of that stuff or if you've watched the news and the commentary that's come out, how do we as Christians conduct ourselves in the middle of this mess? How do, we, how do we do this? I can say this, the way we do will speak volumes about our God. I have seen Christians over the years 
through Facebook and different arenas say and write things that are so full of venom and hate for certain politicians. And by hate, I don't mean they just disagree with them. I mean mean-spirited, evil-wishing, hate-filled words. That doesn't honor God. We can disagree, but do we do so with love and humility and grace? See, that points to a life that's been transformed by God. It's a result of walking in the Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit have control and developing this inside of us so that as we encounter things that are difficult, leaders that we don't agree with, leaders that appear to be evil, we can still interact with love and humility and respect. And as Americans, voice our concerns place our votes, but do it with love and respect. As we move towards the end of this passage, Peter tells his readers, live as people who are free. We're free. See, it's, it's, our freedom is rooted in our freedom in Christ. Some of these readers, the original readers, were literally slaves. And we'll see next week, he addresses slaves. And all of them certainly were under Roman rule. But in Christ, you're free. So live lives as free men. But Peter gives some boundaries to this freedom. He puts some restraints in as he says, live as free men. He gives a few statements as he, after this, this statement of being free. He says, don't use your freedom to cover up evil. Don't hide behind this freedom in order to sin. And specifically, don't use your freedom to disobey authority or disrespect authority or be hateful towards authority. Freedom should always be used to bring honor to God. And to honor God, we need to live in submission to authority. Unless it violates God's authority. Second, he says, Live as a servant of God. Submit, not just to those leaders, but submit to God. Our ability to submit to authority is directly tied to our submission to God. He says, honor everyone. Show proper respect to all. If anyone is going to step out of line in terms of how we behave with one another, let it be them. Not us. Not believers in Jesus Christ. How do you reach out to somebody if if all you do is disrespect and disobey and, and yell venomous, hateful things? Let the cross offend people, not us. We know the cross. I mean, that that's clear. Scripture says that the the cross of Christ is offensive. So let that be offensive, not us. Love the brotherhood. Love one another. The way we love one another demonstrates this to the world. Fear God. The fear of God over the fear of kings or emperors. To have proper fear is to have reverence and awe, and it leads to our obedience to God. And lastly, and this had to be radical, honor the emperor. Remember, Nero. I don't care how much you like or dislike Trump or Nancy Pelosi or you name them, they ain't got nothing on Nero. And Peter says, honor the emperor. Wow. We're free, but we are under the rule of our God and we are his servants. And that always dictates our loyalties, our behaviors, and our posture in society. And it will be that posture that will speak to the culture around us. Next week, we'll continue on looking at other examples of good deeds. This is one, how we conduct ourselves as citizens. Um, We'll look at more next week. Let's close in prayer. God, um, this is a hard one. 
especially right now in a divided country that we live in and the ideas that are percolating out there, the philosophies amongst our politicians, it has so divided us as a nation. And we have strong feelings. And the temptation, and God, I feel it myself, my temp- the temptation is to get angry and to lash out and want to say horrible things. But God, you've called us to love and to pray and to submit. Unless 